بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد. So uh, today's talk won't be that long, but it's the conclusion of this talk basically is um, those amongst our Indian subcontinent brothers and sisters who are already proficient with the Quran, Hufad, etc. <coughs> Uh, I would strongly recommend them, uh, who far than those who are proficient with the Quran, who have um, grown up with the Taj Company Mus'haf, which is commonly known as the 13 line Quran. But the Taj Company doesn't only publish the 13 line Quran, he also, he also has a 9 line Quran, a 10 line Quran, an 11 line Quran, 13 lines, 14 lines, 16, 17 lines based on varying sizes and also uh, the traveler version of the Mus'haf published by Taj company is 17 lines. The um, one published in uh, Medina Munawwara in the Prophet city in the King Fahad uh, printing complex, that's 15 lines. But the common ones, but, but the most commonly used one is the 13 line. So, um, so for those who have grown up with that, who have studied the Quran with that uh, copy of the Quran, that print of the Quran, um, they should uh, consider upgrading themselves, I would say, to um, the Mus'haf of Medina or the other various Mus'ahif that are published around the Arab world. So, so for example, there's also Mus'haf Qatar, there's a Mus'haf Bahrain, there's, a, there's an Egyptian Mus'haf as well. And there's other masahif as well, but the, the script in them is slightly complicated for people who have become accustomed with the script of the subcontinent Taj company, Mus'haf. And the reason I say this is because um, if, let's go back a bit, scholars throughout history have always strived for accuracy and um, perfection when it comes to the script of the Quran. So much so that, that uh, even up to today, if there is a single error within the Mus'haf, um, such a Mus'haf is respectfully discarded. It's not allowed to be circulated. And previously we have seen in centuries gone by, and we don't see that, that, that often anymore, that um, enemies of Islam tried to introduce various versions of the Qur'an within the Ummah that were not accurate. Uh, the Kalamullah wasn't accurately represented in those. But Alhamdulillah, those um, plots failed. Um, nowadays, the threat is different. Nowadays, the threat is about interpretation and uh, authenticity, etc., etc. But in terms of the script of the Qur'an, th that's a foregone conclusion that that is preserved by the Ummah. And the Ummah is quite meticulous in this regard as to preserving the script of the Qur'an. And obviously, um, the Qur'an describes itself as بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ That um, indeed, that the, this Qur'an are a compilation of verses that are preserved in the chests, the breasts, the hearts of those who have been given knowledge. And this was how the primary transmission of the Qur'an was in the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also in the subsequent few generations. The primary mode of transmission was oral, um, mouth to mouth, or as the Qur'an describes it, chest to chest, breast to breast, heart to heart. And obviously the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ummi, he was unlettered. and. Um, so um, oral transmission was the primary mode of transmission and that was also the primary mode of the preservation of the Qur'an in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and a few decades after his passing. And um, in the time of Abu Bakr and in the time of Umar especially in battles such as Yamama, where a lot of Sahaba were martyred, and those Sahaba who were martyred, they were they had memorized the Quran or they had memorized a large 
large portions of the Quran, they their martyrdom or their death sparked a fear of a loss within the Quran. And obviously Allah says in that we revealed the dhikr which is the Quran and we are the ones who will preserve it. But it's not as if there's any direct divine intervention from Allah that um, <laughs> he'll preserve it directly without any um, contribution from the Muslims. Rather the Sahaba understood that it is our duty to do our utmost best to preserve the Quran uh, as how Allah commanded us to do so. So um, the preservation of the Quran comes in various forms, the um, wordings of the Quran, the meanings of the Quran, the interpretation of the Quran. So at that moment in time, it was the very words of the Quran themselves that needed to be preserved. And with the martyrdom of all these Sahaba in these battles, uh, the Sahaba consulted with one another and they decided that they should uh, make a master copy of the Quran where various fragments of the Quran which were dispersed amongst the Sahaba within their households written on paper or bone or vellum or leather or other various places that would all be compiled within one place and this happened in the time of Abu Bakr an. and uh, this was the first time where the Quran was really brought together in one place but still at that time the primary mode of transmission and preservation of the Quran was oral it wasn't written uh, fast forward to the time of Uthman radiallahu an, and uh, in the time of Uthman radiallahu an, uh, a new threat emerged and that threat was uh, by no malicious intent but rather what happened was as the Sahaba were conquering faraway lands uh, especially non-Arab lands and when they got to the conquest of uh, Azerbaijan and, and uh, Armenia that region what happened was obviously the Prophet وسلم, instituted the various ahruf or the different types of different modes of reciting the Quran and this was maintained in the, uh, in the last two years of the Prophet uh, just to um, offer a side note the reason why this occurred was because in the last two years of the uh, lifetime of the Prophet the wufud the delegations from across Arabia came to Medina to accept Islam okay and they came in their thousands and obviously those who stayed at home across Arabia were more than those who came to Medina and this is all obviously um uh, represented in the Quran, Allah says, "Ida jaa nasulai wal fath wa raayt al nasayid khuluna fi din lai afwaja wa raayt al nasayid khuluna fi din lai afwaja." And you see the people entering the Deen of Allah in huge groups, afwaja. Uh, so their Arabic was quite different from the Arabic that was spoken by the Prophet Sallallahu and obviously the Quran was revealed in the language in the dialect specifically of the Prophet Sallallahu and that's the dialect of the Quraysh but it wasn't that wasn't the case across Arabia now nowadays um, the Quran and the Hadith we have in front of us and also the uh, scholarly texts they all tend to conform with the dialect of the Quraysh so we don't see that difference as apparent as it was back then but back then there were many dialects and uh, many of those dialects to varying degrees differed with the dialect of the Quraysh. So uh, the problem then was how can guidance of Islam be imparted to all the Arabs across Arabia who are accepting Islam when they couldn't even understand half or quarter or even two thirds of the Quran. Okay. So that was the problem. So they had the base there of the Arabic language, but the dialects were wildly different. So how were they accommodated? So they were accommodated via the Ahruf, and Ahruf means, there's difference of opinion as to what Ahruf means, but loosely translated, it means modes of recitation. 
and in this allowance in the last two years of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as per the as per the hadith in the Quran unzila ala sabati ahrufin faqra'u ma tayassara min that the Quran has been revealed according to seven ahruf so read whatever is easy for you um, the the allowance was that um, tribes across Arabia who didn't speak the dialect of the Prophet Sallallahu or the dialect of the, of the Quran, they were allowed to change words here and there to um, in, during their recitation in order for them to understand and appreciate the beauty of Islam. Okay, So that was in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and this was maintained throughout the last two years of Prophet Sallallahu life into the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, into the time of Umar radiallahu an, and into the time of Uthman radiallahu an, or initially at least. The problem then arose in the time of Uthman radiallahu an that they were, con- they were conquering, the Muslim armies were conquering faraway lands. So I, I mentioned Azab- Az- Azerbaijan and Armenia. And over there, you had new converts to Islam. And different Sahaba were reading the Quran in different ways and those who were new to Islam they didn't appreciate the fact that there can be different different modes of recitations as as instituted by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and if you are told that the Quran is the word of Allah and you don't know about the allowance that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam towards the end of his life then obviously you'll think that the person who's reading in a different manner is reading it wrong. Okay? So, why was that a problem when they were conquering Azerbaijan and Armenia? Why wasn't it a problem before then? Surely this problem would have uh, a, a risen uh, before that. And indeed, in the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a Sahabi, uh, Hakim ibn Hisham. Is it Hakim ibn Hisham or Hisham ibn Hakim? Hakim ibn Hisham, he accepted Islam and he read the Quran in a manner which Umar radiallahu anh felt was something he hadn't learned from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Umar grabbed him and took him to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and um, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told Umar to read the way he taught him. Then he told uh, Hakim to read radiallahu anh. He was a Quraysh as well to read the way he taught him and he told he he, he said to both of them hakada unzilat hakada unzilat this is how the quran has been revealed this is how the quran has been revealed so what do you think the problem is when you muslim armies are conquering places like azerbaijan and armenia that led uthman radiallahu to take the drastic action that he did in terms of compiling the Qur'an according to the dialect of the Quraysh, according to the dialect of the Prophet ﷺ, and all other copies of the Qur'an in any other dialect are to be burned. Why wasn't this done before? Why, what's special about Azerbaijan and Armenia? Any thoughts? Remember the context. The context is Muslim armies. That's the context. So if you have Muslim armies conquering, who are the first people going to be there in those lands? Mm-hmm. Soldiers. And soldiers are armed to the teeth. Yeah, it's not like Omar and Hakim, the two civilians in Medina. You have Muslim soldiers, many of them who are new converts to Islam. They have swords, they have um, other weaponry in front, in, within their grasp. And uh, they're coming to blows, and when they come to blows, they're not, they're not just going to grab each other by the neck or throw a few punches here and there. They're going to use their weapons if you're reading the Quran the wrong way, intentionally. So that was the specific problem which was really relayed back to Uthman radiallahu in Medina. So obviously Uthman radiallahu uh, initiated, initiated the project of compiling the mass, uh, a copy of the Quran and eliminating all other dialects of the Quran. So there were two compilations, okay? There was one compilation in the time of Uthman radiallahu which I've just described. And there was another compilation earlier on in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. That, that compilation in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu wasn't to eliminate other modes of recitation, 
but rather it was simply to preserve whatever there was scattered across uh, uh, Medina and the outskirts of Medina into one master copy. So dialects weren't as of an issue, as big of an issue or significant an, an issue in the time of Bakr as it was in the time of Uthman radiallahu anh. So there were two compilations, both with different objectives and they were both um, achieved walillah alhamd. So, so by the time of Uthman radiallahu so Uthman radiallahu prepared copies of the Quran, four, five or six, and he sent them out to the major cities of the then Islamic State. And obviously, back then, uh, you had um, people, when they get, get, get access of a copy of the Qur'an, they would simply, someone would read it out to them and they would write it down. Or they would copy it directly from the master copy. And, uh, and that is how um, the Qur'an was started to, uh, the shift occurred from it being a primary Oral, orally transmitted document to primarily being a, a document that was uh, uh, transmitted through written format. Okay. So it, when so nowadays, uh, when we want to ascertain whether a verse has been recited correctly or not, we don't. Uh, and, and two people are differing over something, and they both hold fast. We don't say, oh, you both transmitted it that way. You've transmitted it that orally. You'd refer back to the master, co uh, a copy, a mushaf, a copy of the Quran. So the primary mode of preservation, at least in terms of the wording and the script nowadays, is uh, written. But initially, before the time of Uthman of the Lawan, it was oral transmission. Okay. So, and that is the default. Okay, that's the default of the ummah. It's primarily an oral transmission. It's uh, they are verses that are preserved in the chests of the of of, of people. Uh, but that that doesn't mean that um, if someone found a mushaf, a copy of the Quran, and they don't have a teacher, but they have some knowledge, familiarity with Arabic, that they're not allowed to read the Quran. They're still allowed to read the Quran. Okay, if they find a copy of the Quran. So that's the issue of transmission. Now, when it comes to the issue of um, the script of the Quran, just that uh, other week I was told that uh, Mulla Ali Qari, one of the major scholars of the Hanafi Madhab, 11th century, a major scholar, his uh, profession or the, the manner in which he uh, got his income for his livelihood was writing copies of the Quran. So um, you go back three centuries, four centuries, many scholars would have, uh, not, not only of the Quran, but also other various Islamic books, their primary mode of gaining revenue for themselves and their families would have been writing things which other people would not be able to. So Mullah Ali Qari would write uh, the Mus'haf and uh, would sell those copies to other people so he could continue with his uh, religious and um, ilmi uh, activities. Um, now, obviously, the, uh, later on, the printing press came, and um, the printing press obviously is r a relatively recent phenomenon. It's only been in vogue within the um, Islamic Muslim Ummah for the past two centuries or so. And um, in terms of um, the printing press, um, the printing press um, obviously overpowered the institution of calligraphy and uh, written preservation of the Quran. So as the printing press became more popular, the art that is the calligraphy of the Quran and manually writing the Quran, uh, they, they shifted. Uh, so in terms of uh, the printing press, obviously major printing press presses were established across the um, Muslim populace. So um, there was one in Egypt that was established, uh, known in uh, scholarly circles as the um, Bulaq. So the Bulaq, or also known, it, it, it's had various uh, names, but um, Bulaq is, is it, they've published many books of the scholars. Uh, and one of the distinctive features of the Bulaq print is that uh, major scholars and Famous editors worked there. 
So the ratio of errors within the works published there within the early part of the 20th century, they were very few compared to other printing houses because major scholars worked in, in that particular printing press, publishing house. Then you had uh, a few popping up over in the Maghrib. Then you had one that uh, was established in uh, Lahore, which is the Taj Company. So the Taj Company was um, established in uh, the 1920s. So in Lahore, in British India, obviously. And uh, they published a Mus'haf. And that Mus'haf became extremely popular within large parts of the Indian subcontinent. And it was also transported to other parts of the um, Muslim world, especially in the Arab world, where they didn't particularly have a, a um, printing press per se. Only the, the, um, the Arab world only started recently, relatively speaking, uh, start to publish their uh, Masahif. So now you have the Mus'haf Medina. The Mus'haf Medina only came into being after King Fahad uh, printing complex was established in the 1980s. And the Mus'haf Medina came into being. Mus'haf Qatar is only two decades old. Uh, then you have Mus'haf Bahrain, even that is only a decade or so old. You had the Mus'haf Oman. There's a Mus'haf in Oman that was published in 2006, I believe. But the, but the, uh, the ancient print, printed versions of the Quran, they're in Egypt, they're in uh, British India. And uh, there's one in Turkey, I believe, and there's one in the Maghrib, I believe. Okay. So the Taj Company Mus'haf became extremely popular. If we look at the Taj Company Mus'haf that was established in the 1930s, and if you compare that with the Taj Company Mus'haf we have nowadays, uh, or, or the or the format of it, um, there hasn't been much in terms of editing, updating, um, upgrading, so to speak, of the text. It's been um, left as it is, and understand, understandably so, because, uh, believe it or not, um, publishing Masahif is a huge cash cow, especially if you have a monopoly over it, like the Taj company did in the subcontinent. Um, so, um, there wasn't any incentive for them to um, really update it. And what do we mean by update? It does, we're not saying that the, the Quran they publish is wrong. What we mean by that is to um, incorporate elements which are, for example, uh, pertaining to the wuquf of the Quran, where to stop your, uh, where, uh, in between verses, within verses, in terms of uh, the numbering of the verses, yeah. In terms of, for example, um, wh how a page should start and how sh it should end. Should it end at a verse or do you carry on? Um, and also, in, when it comes to the ruku and the sujood, um, there, there, there are quite a few um, rhetorical errors, so to speak. So when, when we talk about, so for example, uh, in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, in the first ruku, the first ruku ends at um, Inna ansha'na huna insha'an fajalna huna abkara uruban atraba li ashab al-yameen and the ruku ends there. Whereas the ruku should be ending at thullatu min al-awwalina wa thullatu min al-akhirin. And then the next ruku should start at wa ashabu shibal, the people of the left, the people of Jahannam. Okay? So it shouldn't be thullatu min al-awwalina wa thullatu min al-akhirin. Two verses speaking about the people of Jannah which has been the topic for the entire Ruku previous, and then was, and it speaks about the people of Jahannam. So two, two verses from the people of Jannah and then speaking about Jahannam doesn't make sense. And there's other examples of this in um, scattered across the Quran, which hasn't really been updated or upgraded. So, and there's uh, various other elements which we'll go into in a bit uh, that uh, demonstrates that um, it's an outdated, print of the Quran, which should have been updated, but it wasn't due to various factors, one factor which I identified just now. So, 
At the same time, when the Taj company Mus'haf was established, uh, various qaidas or exercise books to teach children how to read Arabic were established. And the most popular of those was the Nuran, Nurani Qaida. The Nurani Qaida is written by a, a uh, scholar called Maulana Nur Muhammad Haqqani. He passed away in the early part of the um, previous century. Uh, and uh, the, um, the Nurani Qaida is, na is named after him, Nurani Qaida. And uh, his Qaida became extremely popular. So just like the Taj company must have become extremely popular, the Nurani, Nurani Qaida also became extremely popular, such that uh, it was also transferred to the Arab countries um, where children were taught the Nurani Qaida. Now coming to um, the uh, Masahif of the of the Gulf, so the Mus'haf of Medina and the Mus'haf of Qatar, Mus'haf of Bahrain, Mus'haf of Oman. Um, those are the ones I want to focus on today. Um, they are very nice. The script is very nice. They are updated. There have been scholarly committees sitting on uh, the procurement and the um, publication of those masahif and they are in line with the most up-to-date accurate information when it comes to the script of the quran the wuquf of the quran where to stop and also other other supplementary issues that support the um the script of the quran okay so if you look at the um musaf of medina for example and i got this copy when i went to hajj in um, 2011, so uh, when uh, you leave the airport after Hajj, they give you a copy of the Quran, and it says in front, on the front of mine, "Hadiyatu Khadim al Haramayn Sharifain, Al Maliki Abdullah ibn Abdul Aziz al Saud." King Abdullah was uh, ruling back then, obviously. "Ila Hujjaj Baytillah al Haram." So a gift from King Abdullah to the Hujjaj. And this was in 2011. Uh, I also went to Hajj in 1997 and I got a, um, this is a blue and white version, by the way. Um, they also have a green and gold version, which you might have seen. So I got a green and gold version when I, when I went in 1997 and it was King Fahad's name on that one. So if you look at the end of um, this copy of the Quran, and they all have these from Mus'haf al Madina, it tells you the entire methodology of how it was written and which scholarly works uh, were, were consulted when uh, determining the verses of the Quran, determining where to stop in the, within the Quran, uh, determining whether a surah is Makki or Madani, revealed in Makkah or revealed in Medina. Um, by the way, Makki and Madani doesn't mean revealed in Makkah and revealed in Medina. Makki and Madani, when it comes to surah, means revealed before Hijrah and revealed after Hijrah. Okay? Uh, some surahs have verses that were revealed in Mecca and in Medina, both of them. So in that situation, you look at the majority or the bulk number of verses that were revealed to determine whether a surah is Makki or Madani. So the the um, the rasm was taken from a book called Al-Tiraz ala Dabt al kharraz by Imam Al-Tanasi. Um, the... Um, the uh, the numbering of the verses was ta was taken from the book Al Bayan by Abu Amr Al Dani. Abu, Abu Amr Al Dani was a major scholar of Qiraat, and also Nadima to Zuhr by Imam Al Shatibi, again a major scholar of Qiraat. In terms of uh, the the um, the ruku, and, and and in this Mus'haf Medina, they don't have the ruku like they have in the Taj Company uh, Mus'haf. They have um, uh, one eighths and halves and quarters. So each Jews of the Quran, one, two, three, up to 30, each Jews is split into eight parts, okay? And that's taken from Ghaythu al-Nafr by Imam al-Safaqusi. Safaqusi. You know where Safaqus is? In English you say S-Fax, it's in Tunisia. S-F-A-X. And also, when it comes to um, the wuquf, it, it's taken from the book Al Muktafa fil Waqfi wal Ibtida again by Abu Amr al Dani, and also also by Abu Jafar al Nahas in his book Al Qat wal Itinaf. And in terms of the Sajda to Tilawa, it's, it's taken from the various books of Fiqh, 
and it goes on and on. So that's the methodology. In terms of the Taj Mus'haf, we don't, we're not, there is no methodology published at the back of the Mus'haf. Uh, what we do know is that the Wuquf are taken from a book called by Ilal al Wuquf, uh, written by a scholar call, called Sajawandi. And he was a fifth century scholar, I believe. His book has been published. Um, the issue with that book, Ilal al Wuquf by Sajawandi, is that um, within the scholarly fraternity, his methodology of determining the wuquf of the Quran wasn't really accepted. And uh, the, the, the modern editor who worked on it uh, does highlight some areas where um, his uh, methodology was found to be problematic. And we'll discuss that uh, in a minute. Um, in terms of where the rasam was taken from, I'm not sure where it was taken from. Maybe that information is out there somewhere, but it's not, uh, when I was researching for this lecture, <laughs> I couldn't find where. Maybe you know, you, you don't know. Um, in terms of um, the um, the uh, the methodology of determining whether a surah is Makki or Madani, no idea where that's from either. Uh, in terms of the numbering of the verses, I don't know where this mushaf takes it from either. So, um, wallahu alam. Um, so, um, if you want to say a more critical version of the Quran, the, 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 they are um, the Mus'haf of Qatar, Mus'haf of Medina, Mus'haf of uh, Bahrain, and Mus'haf of Oman. In addition to the Mus'haf of Misr and the Mus'haf of um, the Maghrib and Algeria and Libya, they, they all have their own Mus'ahib, by the way. The, there's a Mus'haf of Algeria. Mus'haf of uh, Libya, uh, Libya, Mus'haf of the Maghrib, Mus'haf of Mauritania, which was just published uh, ten, some 10 years ago. Then obviously you have the Mus'haf of Medina, Mus'haf of Qatar, Mus'haf of um, Bahrain, uh, Mus'haf of... Uh, the Mus'haf of Bahrain, by the way, the, the, the calligrapher for that is the same as the Mus'haf of Medina, so, uh, Sheikh Uthman Taha, who's still alive. And, um, and obviously Turkey has its own Mus'haf. Um, now, obviously the Nurani Qaeda was still being used at the time when the Mus'haf of Medina was published uh, four decades ago, or three and a half decades ago, the Nurani Qaeda. But the Nurani Qaeda was mostly tailored for the Taj Company Mus'haf. It wasn't tailored for the specific needs of um, children who, want, who are going to study the Mus'haf Medina, etc. So the, the, the scholars in Qatar, they took the Nurani Qaeda and they adapted it and they made their own Qaeda, which is now published under the name Al Durus Al Hijaiya. I had a copy of it at home, but I've misplaced it somewhere. But um, if you go online, you'll find it. And um, hopefully, Sheikh uh, will uh, upload uh, the link to that. There's also an application, mobile application for it. And um, if you go to Qatar, if you get the chance to go to Qatar, if someone goes to Qatar and you, you go to the Wazarat al there, they distribute this for free. And um, it's, it's in its, it's in its um, 21st or 22nd edition now. So you can see they're up, up, upgrading and updating it all the time. Now, Alhamdulillah, it's all color coded and it's really easy to use. And um, I got my guy working in the Wazarat al in Qatar, and I've proposed to him that this needs to be translated into English. It's in Arabic, obviously, for Arab children, but the instructions need to be translated into English so it can be used as a Qaida for English-speaking children. So we'll see where that goes. Um, so they distribute it for free. Uh, it's a really nice book, and uh, I actually taught the, uh, a child who's on the spectrum of, of autism and alhamdulillah he um, one or two months and uh, he was uh, really proficient with um, reading the Arabic language and with the exercises and he was able to um, with ease not with fluency but with ease recite um, from a copy of the Quran, the Mus'haf of uh, Medina, the Mus'haf of Medina, because 
the adapted version of Nurani Qaida, which is published from Qatar, Durus al Hijaiya, is tailored for the um, is tailored for the Musaf of Medina. Is tailored for the Musaf of Medina. So when the Musaf of Medina was published, the Nurani Qaida was adapted and um, repurposed to cater for students who are going on to study the Musaf of Medina. And obviously the Musaf of Medina was published way before the Musaf of Qatar and the other Musahif of the, in, in the Gulf states. But then there's, there's not that much difference between those Musahif and Musaf of Qatar and Musaf of Medina. Uh, you, if a person studies or if a child studies at Durus al they can, they can go on to read any of those Musahif. Now, if you look at the Musaf of Medina, it's got a few distinctive qualities which I really like. And this, by the way, is uh, 2011. The, I'm, I'm sure they've updated it since then, but uh, the fundamentals of it are the same. Um, so every page starts and ends at the beginning and an end of a verse, respectively. Every page. So if a person is doing hifth of the Quran, memorizing the Quran, and they memorize one page a day, it will take them 604 days if they study, if they memorize a page. So um, <laughs> that, if you're a Hiv student, you know that um, there's, an, there's somewhat of an anxiety attached to determining how much you're going to memorize every day or every night, preparing for the next day. So that anxiety is taken out of this uh, print. So it tells you uh, uh, every page starts and ends. It starts at the beginning of the verse and ends at the end of the verse. Um, so there's that. The, uh, it's, it's a highly accurate and a beautiful rendition of the script of the Quran. It was done by Sheikh Uthman Taha. Um, Sheikh Uthman Taha is a Syrian from Aleppo or the Aleppo region and he moved and he was brought to Saudi Arabia after the King Fahad uh, publishing complex was established in the 1980s and he was appointed as the official scribe or the official calligrapher for the Mus'haf of Medina. So since the 1980s he's written with his own hands a total of 12 or 13 Mus'hafs. One Mus'haf takes three years for him. So uh, th there's a dedication to that, as you can see. And prior to that, he wrote one in Syria. He wrote a few in Syria before he was uh, called to uh, come to Saudi Arabia. And I believe he just gained citizenship uh, two years ago, Saudi citizenship, uh, by royal decree. So <laughs> it took him that long. In addition, I just now want, I want to focus on um, highlighting some differences between the Taj Company Mus'haf and all and the um, Musaf of Medina. So, um, if you look at uh, so, for example, uh, Exhibit One in your handout. So this is from the first page or second page of Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah says, "Who um, alladhi anzal alaykal kitab minhu ayatu muhkamatun hunna unnu al-kitab wa ukhur mutashabihat." فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ بُتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَبُتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلِهِ وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلٌّ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا وَمَا يَذَّكَرُ إِلَّا أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ Okay, so the point here I want to highlight is where Allah says, or where it's written, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا in the Taj Company Mus'haf, which is based on Sajawandi's work, Ilalul Wuquf, there's a meme there. And you do know what meme means, right? Anyone? What does meme mean in the Taj Company Mus'haf? Meme. Waqf Lazim. You have to stop. Waqf Lazim means you have to stop. So. You have to stop. The, the The implication of that is that if you don't stop, then the meaning is altered into a potentially incorrect meaning. Okay. Um, what is the problem with that? Any ideas? Is there a problem with that? 
having a meme there? Any ideas? No, no, having the meme there, I'm telling you there's a problem. What is that problem? So, so waqf is all based on, about, uh, waqf is all based on meaning, right? So if it makes sense to stop there, you're going to stop there. I mean, it doesn't make, to stop, it doesn't make, to make sense to stop. You're not going to stop. Now, in this particular verse, there's two tafsirs. There's two interpretations. There's one interpretation which says that, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Full stop. Only Allah knows the interpretation of it, of these mutashabihat verses. But in another interpretation of, the, of this verse, the Mufassirun say, of that view, they say that uh, this verse actually means only Allah and Ar-Rasikhun fil ilm, those who are erudite in their knowledge, know the meaning of the mutashabihat. So, if you're going to take that second interpretation, does it make sense to have a meme there? In fact, putting a meme there actually criminalizes somewhat the second opinion. It completely disregards it. So um, it, would, it wouldn't be appropriate to have a meme there in the first place. And this is one example of many which are highlighted to, to underscore the, um, the problematic nature of uh, Sajawandi's methodology when it comes to wukuf on which the Taj, Mus'haf is, uh, Taj company Mus'haf is based. If you look at the Mus'haf Medina in blue, um, yeah, it, it doesn't have a meme. It doesn't have a meme in the Mus'haf period, I think. <laughs> it just has Qaf Lam Ya. Qaf Lam Ya means Al Waqfu Awla. Stopping there is better. And Saad Lam Ya, just in the line above that means Al Waslu Awla. To continue is better, but if you stop there, that's fine as well. So al um, awla to stop there is better, meaning there is room for interpretation. There is room for an alternative interpretation, but the dominant interpretation is that only Allah knows the meaning of the mutajabiyat, so it's better to stop there. Okay. If you look at um, Exhibit Three. Um, Allah says, this is Surah Shura. إِن يَشَأْ يُسْكِنِ الرِّيحَ فَيَظْلَلْنَ رَوَاكِدَ عَلَىٰ ظَهْرِهِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ أَوْ يُوبِقُهُنَّ بِمَا كَسَبُوا وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ وَيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ And I have a personal story on this. So Allah says, وَيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ And so that those who are argumentative about our ayat, they know that they don't have any escape. وَيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ It's a whole sentence. It's one sentence. So why is there a ta there in the middle? And ta in the Mus'haf Taj, Taj company Mus'haf means, it means stop. It's not as severe as meme, but it means stop. وَقْفْ مُطْلَقْ it, it, it indicates that the sentence has finished. Now another item is to be discussed. So why is there a ta'a there? It's a rhetorical question. It shouldn't be there. Okay, it's wrong. Um, and uh, when I was a student doing translation of the Quran back when I was 15 or 16 in Dewsbury, I translated it based on the waqf. So I translated وَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا Full stop. And then I translated مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ as a separate sentence. And it was completely wrong. <laughs> and the teacher highlighted that. And uh, I'm not sure if it was exams or not, or just before exams, but um, I was given a stern telling, uh, stern t telling off. Um, but um, the irony here is that the same teacher was teaching us the wukuf of the Qur'an in another lesson, in the Tajweed lesson. And the wukuf are based on um, this <laughs> Sajawandi. So, um, and he was a stickler for that. He was really adamant that these wukuf should be adhered to, etc., etc. So, I adhered, I, I adhered to the uh, translation, uh, to this wukuf when I was translating, and he, he was completely wrong. If you look at all translation of the Qur'an, in English, 
and there are dozens of them. None of them take into consideration this ta, this waqf in the middle. They all translate it properly. So this calls into question, and I've also checked the books of Tafsir, if there's an interpretation, a possible interpretation that suggests that is a whole sentence, or you should stop there, and ma'alahum min is a separate sentence, and there is no indication whatsoever given in any Tafsir, especially those Tafsir that deal with the grammar and the language of the Quran, like Zamakhshari or Abu Hayyan's al bahrul Muhit or Tafsir Abu Saud, Etc. Etc. Those types of tafsir, no, none ever give the indication that um, the uh, the sentence is completed in the middle of, of, of the verse there. So, so that that type of waqf you won't find in the Mus'haf Medina if you look at the scan underneath that one. If you look at Okay, th- those were two examples of uh, the waqf going wrong in the Mus'haf Taj. And th- there's other issues with the Mus'haf Taj as well. And again, it's all based on Sajawandi. You can, you can appreciate the fact that they were relying on Sajawandi, a 5th century scholar who wrote a book on Wuquf. Uh, but but uh, with these obvious errors, not to mention uh, the other side effects, I would say, of the alamatul uh, waqf which are in uh, the mushaf uh, taj so for example la what does la mean la means don't stop it's like don't stop it's like uh, on the road you have the stop sign so imagine you have the stop sign and people a person who reads the stop sign never never stops there continues all the time it would be problematic right so the tendency you have, especially amongst non-Arabs or those who don't understand the Quran, if they see Allah, they always stop there. <laughs> They'll always stop there. And if you're a HIV student and you want a breath, you want to catch a breath, you'll stop there as well. So, um, the, the, in, in an attempt of being precise with where to stop and where not to stop, Sajawandi inadvertently created the effect that people, when they read Allah within the Mus'haf, Nowadays, represented in the Musaf Taj, the Taj Company Musaf, they always stop there. Allah the Atama whom in Jew and Amana whom in Hauf is a whole verse. So Allah the Atama Minjoo, he has a ladder, everyone stops at Minjoo. Everyone stops at Minjoo. You shouldn't stop there. It doesn't make sense to stop there. And if that law wasn't there, no one would have stopped there. Everyone would have read Allah the Atama Minjoo and Amana Min Hauf. In addition to the fact that there are many verses, full verses with a circle. They have a law on top of the circle. That doesn't make sense either. It doesn't make sense. I mean, if you want to read on, read on, based on the meaning. If it's a, if it's a short verse, Ya ayyul muddathiru qum fa'andhiru wa rabbaka fa'kabil wa thiyabaka fa'tahir. Ya ayyul muzzamminu qum illayla illa qalila, etc. Wal asri inna l'insan lafi khusr. You don't need a law there on top of the verse end. Um... If you look at, uh, so that's waqf then. If you look at exhibit two, another issue with um, the Taj company Mus'haf, and this is found in other Mus'haf as well, but it's pr- predominantly found in Taj Mus'haf. Can you see the wow at the end of the line? The, the first line. As-sabirina wal-sadiqina wal-qanitina wal-sabirina wal-sadiqina wal-qanitina wal-munfiqina wal-mustaghfirina Bilashar. A single letter word, wa, which means and in Arabic. You cannot stop on a single letter word. So you can't read as-sabirina wa sadiqina wal qanitina wal munfiqina. You can't read like that. A single single letter words like the a, uh, which is a question, which is like a question. Especially Hamza and Wa, because they're written separately, they're never joined to the letter coming after them. These are stingy letters. Ham, uh, alif, Wow, Dal, Dal, Ra, Za. They never join on to the next letter, even if it's in the same word. So, um, single letter words still technically are always, always should be written with the word that comes after them. So, Wal Mustaghfirun should be written as one word, okay? Um, 
so that's a small issue with uh, the Mus'haf Taj. Uh, this is found repeatedly within the Mus'haf Taj, and um, it should be written together with the word coming after that. So if you look at Exhibit 5 um, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, فَأَتْبَعُوهُمْ مُشْرِقِينَ فلما تراء الجمعان قال أصحاب موسى إنا لمدركون قال كلا إن معي ربي سيهدين. So I've just highlighted in the Mus'haf Medina. فلما تراء الجمعان قال أصحاب موسى إنا لمدركون. Okay. So if you're a non-Arab or if you don't speak Arabic and you're reading verse 61, okay. فلما تراء الجمعان. So for some reason. Or for whatever reason you want to stop on a word, on the word after falamma, how would you stop? Falamma. Say falamma. Based on the script here, falamma. Tara. You just say falamma tara because that's how it's, how it's written, right? That's an error. You can't read like that. Tara is not a word, okay? Now, if you look at uh, the Mus'haf Medina, they make it more simplified and easier for you to read it in the correct manner. Falamma, falamma tara'a. So if you want to stop on that word, that is the correct way to stop on the tara'a is the word, it's the verb from tara'a ya tara'a, to look at one another. So obviously the story is speaking about the army of Fir'aun and the, the, the Israelites uh, who were on, just on the sea and uh, the army of Fir'aun had almost caught up to them such that they could see one another, okay? That's what, that is what tara'a means, to see one another. فَلَمَّا تَرَاءَ الْجَمْعَانِ فَلَمَّا تَرَاءَ So this is the issue of tamathul fil rasm. Now tamathul fil rasm means when there's multiple alifs coming together. Okay. So you have in, in the word tara'a. If you look at the word tara'a, how many alifs could have been there? Tara. There's a there's an alif after the ra. Yeah. Tara. There's the hamza a a. There's a second alif. Then tara'a. There's the alif after the hamza. So there's three alifs coming together, okay? Tara'a. So in rasm, you only write one. In the rasm, in the script, you're only allowed to write one. So in the script of the uh, in the script of Uthman, obviously, there were no dots there either. So he would have, or, or the Musaf uh, Uthman would have only written the ta without the dot, without the two dots on the ta, then the ra, and then one alif. Okay, so um, scholars d differ, uh, the scholars of script differ which alifs are to be deleted in script. Is it the first alif or is it the last alif? So the Taj Mus'haf deletes the second, the, the last alif, or in this case, the last two alifs. Tara'a. So it takes the alif after the ra, it writes that down. And that's a proper script, the full alif. And the, uh, the Hamza alif is deleted. And the alif after the Hamza, that's also deleted as well. And it's not represented in any way. So if someone reading and someone want to stop there, they'll just read, tara, 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 which is an error. Um, <clears throat> whereas the Mus'haf Medina, they delete, when it comes to these three alif, they keep the last alif, they, they'll keep the last alif. And they'll delete the Hamza Alif and the, they'll delete the, the Alif after the Ra. So if you look at the Ra, the Ra in the Mus'haf Medina, Ta, Ra, and the Alif there is not written. It's just a small Alif. And a small letter means it's not scripted. Okay. And then there's a Hamza alone. And a Hamza alone means also that it's not scripted. Okay. And then there's, there's an Alif after that, which is the final Alif, which is the Alif after the Hamza, the, the pronounced Hamza, and that is scripted because that's a proper full um, alif. So that Mus'haf Medina methodology assists you in 
stopping on such words correctly, okay? This is not always the case. So, okay. The Hamza, by the way, do you know the Hamza when, we, when you study Qaeda, Alif, Ba, Ta, Ta, Hamza, Hamza, yeah. The Hamza is not, is not a letter that was written in the early generations. It, it, it's a later development, okay? So you won't find a Hamza in the Mus'haf of Uthman. You won't find a Hamza in the first, uh, first uh, centuries of Islam, uh, first good few decades or several decades of Islam. Just like there weren't any dots, there weren't Fathah Bamma Kasra, there weren't any Mudud, there was no Hamza either, okay? Hamza is a later development. The introduction of Hamza is a later development. If a Hamza was to be said, it would, it, it would, it would have been written as an Alif or a Wow <coughs> or a Ya, or it wouldn't have been written at all. But it would have been understood. It would have been understood and Arabs would have said it anyway. Just like when we read English, we, read, we, we look at a word, we know instinctively how to pronounce it. We know instinctively when to say present or present, even though it's written the same way. Because we know by context that is to be said as present or is to be said as present. Now, obviously, a person who's not familiar with the language, they wouldn't know how to say present or present or be able to distinguish between them. Likewise, the Arabs, they were able to read the Quran without dots, read the Quran without the Hamza, read the Quran without the Mudud, etc. Because they understood it. But obviously, with the introduction of non-Arabs into the Muslim nation, these um, additions were required and they were incorporated within the, um, within the uh, text. Um, if you look at Exhibit um, six, the last one. Qalu in hadani lasahirani. So the the Taj Mushaf has a ya before the noon. If you can see in hadani, can you see the word hadani? There's a small slither there which is supposed to represent a ya, and I don't know where they got that from. There's no Mus'haf amongst the Mus'haf of Uthman that has a Ya. And the Mus'haf of Medina here has it correct. In Hadani is a Ha, Thal, and Noon. There's no slither for the Ya before the Noon. There is one Qira'a that does read a Ya. And that is the Qira'a of Basra, Abu Amr al-Basri. He reads, Qalu in Hadaini la Sahiran. But even, just because he reads it doesn't mean it's scripted. Okay? So um, Abu Amr al-Basri, one of the seven Imams of Qira'at, um, he was, um, he was, he was severely criticized for reading it that way, Hadaini, with a Ya. Uh, there was a Basran grammarian uh, called Zajjaj, a contemporary of, uh, of uh, I believe he was a contemporary of uh, Abu Amr al-Basri. He said, Ana la ujizu qira'ata Abi Amr khilaf al-mushaf. I do not allow anybody to read this in this verse, the Qira'a of Abu Amr that goes against the, um, the Mus'haf, that goes against the Rasam. On the other hand, um, Abu Amr said that inni la astahi min Allahi an aqra'a hadhani or something to that effect. That I feel shame in front of Allah that I read anything other than hadhani because um, due to grammatical considerations and this is a long issue I don't want to get into but um, back then in the early centuries of Islam uh, the Qira, the Qurra had various tools at their disposal in order to determine uh, which Qira most closely matched the Qira of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam okay <clears throat> um, finally yeah, exhibit uh, four, the first one. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَدْعُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقُوا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَمْ لَهُمْ شِرْكٌ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ إِيتُونِي بِكِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ هَذَا أَوَ ثَارَةٌ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ So, if you want to uh, not stop at في السماوات in the middle of the verse, and you want to carry on, how would you, how would you pronounce that? Anybody else? 
So if you're a non-Arab, or you don't know Arabic, you would just read, أَمْ لَهُمْ شِرْكُمْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ إِيْتُونِي فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ إِيْتُونِي with kitab, like, like a regular Hamza. When in fact the إِيْتُونِي, the Hamza, the Alif with the Hamza, the Kasra, uh, is not a regular Hamza, it's a Hamza tul wasl. It's not, it's, it is not to be pronounced in the middle of your recitation. It's only there to facilitate the beginning of a verse, like Alhamdu. Yeah? So when you read, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, milhamdu. You don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdu. You say milhamdu. So like, that's the same Hamza. The iyyaka na'abudu wa iyyaka nasta'inu ihdinas. You don't read like that. Iyyaka na'abudu wa iyyaka nasta'inu ihdinas sirat al-mustaqib. So this is the same Hamza, Hamza tul wasl. You, you would read, fi samawati. How would you read it? Fi samawati. Ti. Or ti. Yeah, so that's another issue of not knowing Arabic. So if you don't know Arabic and you're told that the Hamza is not to be recited, the Hamza al-Wasl, you would read, okay, the Hamza is not to be pronounced, fi samawati tuni. Which uh, in the Qira'a of uh, the, the Qira'a which we tend to recite, the Qira'a of Hafsan from Asim, even that's an error because e tuni is pronounced as such because of something known in Ilm al-Sarf or Arabic morphology that when two Hamzas come together and the second Hamza has a sukoon, then the second Hamza is changed into a madda letter that conforms with the haraka on the previous letter. So the haraka on the previous letter is kasra. So the second Hamza changes into a ya. So you say e tuni. You don't say it tuni. You don't say it tuni. You say e tuni. Now, if that, hamza, that first Hamza is removed from the equation, and that is removed from the equation because you decided to carry on from before. The second Hamza with the Sukun stays intact. It stays in place. So you will say, Fis samawati tuni. Okay? Fis samawati tuni. Now, obviously, if you don't know Arabic, you wouldn't be, non you wouldn't be any wiser. So the Mus'haf of Medina has it somewhat accommodated in the sense that if someone wants to read on from there, you would know how to read. You would, you would say, Fis samawati tuni. Fis samawati tuni. <clears throat> but if you're going to read from the Mus'haf of Medina as a non Arab, you would still need to know the rule that if you're going to read from, if you're going to stop at as samawat and read from the following word, the second Hamza would have to be changed to a ya. So you can't say, Fis samawat tuni. You can't say that. You have to say, Fis samawat E to ni, okay? Um, and th these are just some examples of many in which um, th they're not major issues. I mean, a, a, a lot of a lot a lot of Muslims read from the Taj Mushaf without issue, without problem. And no one's going to decide on one day that they they're going to stop on the word tara'a. It's not going to happen. But in terms of uh, rigor and um, accuracy and and also for the other considerations that I offered earlier on um, somebody who's um, who's uh, who's a half of those already proficient with the Quran they should consider adopting one of the critically critically edited versions of the Quran such as the Mus'haf of Medina or the uh, Mus'haf of uh, Qatar or even the Mus'haf of uh, Bahrain, or even the Egyptian Mus'haf, um, which are which have been updated and which do conform with um, scholarly norms in terms of the wuquf, in terms of the rasam, in terms of the uh, verse numbering. And they don't have these niggly errors which the Mus'haf Daj has. And um, if someone wants to study uh, one of these masahif, then as a primer, I would strongly recommend getting a Durusul Hijaya from the Wazaratul Awqaf in Qatar and uh, studying that. That is really helpful and it, it will really assist you as a graduate or as a hafid, or it would assist a child as well who, want, who, uh, who is uh, who, whose uh, trajectory or whose uh, direction is to eventually go and read from one of the um, Gulf Masahif, okay?
Any questions before we wrap it up? Because I've gone on a bit. Yeah. Yeah, so every, every Jews in the Mus'haf Medina and Mus'haf Qatar, I think, um, they all have uh, 20 pages for every Jews, except for the 30th Jews. And the reason the 30th Jews has 22 pages is because there are a lot of surahs in the 30th Jews. And uh, the name of the surah takes one line, and then Bismillah Rahman Rahim takes another line, so it takes a lot of space, so they just had to add a two, extra pages, two extra pages for that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it took a lot of skill for Uthman Taha to um, write up this Mus'haf. And uh, when it comes to the Mus'haf Qatar, the Mus'haf Qatar is a very nice Mus'haf as well. If you can get your hands on that, that's great. The, uh, the, the calligrapher for that, his name is uh, Ubaidah Al-Banki. He's a Syrian as well. He actually won a competition in 2001. 120 calligraphers came and he won the competition and he was tasked to write up the Mus'haf Qatar. So he won the competition and he still does it. He, he also wrote, uh, he, also, he also designs the banknotes in Qatar. Qatari Riyal, so he's the calligrapher for that, and um, other various national uh, projects where there's some calligraphy involved, they call on Ubaidah al-Banki uh, to, um, to write. And you'll see his videos on YouTube if you go on YouTube. Even Uthman Taha, you'll see his videos on um, YouTube as well. And the skill and the dedication required for them, uh, for, for their profession, is uh, truly inspirational. Anything else before we wrap it up? Okay, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.